The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. And now we are at the interview part of the show. Uh, today we have uh, an author on and uh, a true crime story. Um, the book is called Luggage by Kroger, a true crime memoir. And the uh, author is with us, Gary Taylor. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. So, Gary, let's, uh, uh, quite the story. Uh, let's tell the audience, how did you get involved in this story and um, get to know every, all the details? Well, uh, the, the story of the book, uh, it uh, recounts a, a year in my life back in 1979-80 when I was the courthouse reporter for the Houston Post, and I began a romantic relationship with a uh, local femme fatale lawyer named Catherine Mahaffey, and um, it uh, evolved from there, and, and uh, it was a... Uh, uh, Quite an, quite an adventure, and it uh, took place in the backdrop of the divorce from my second wife and ended with me uh, getting shot in the head and in the back by Catherine about uh, three or four months after we began our affair. And uh, over the years, it's uh, catapulted me into a position as the poster boy for true life fatal attraction uh, type stories. I've I've been on uh, Oprah Winfrey and been on uh, TV shows in that regard, and um, that's basically the, the the summary of the book. It's uh, told from the first person uh, point of view, and it's uh, essentially a memoir. Uh, but the uh, the spine of the book is uh, is this true crime story about my fatalistic year as uh, as the uh, erstwhile uh, boyfriend of uh, this uh, lawyer named Catherine Mahaffey, who's, uh, who's been uh, investigated in a number of, uh, of uh, cases here in Texas uh, over the years, and, and uh, the only conviction that's ever occurred against her was, in my case, for attempted murder. Wow. Um, so when I was reading this, you were, uh, you know, the kind of the um, outline of it. You were the uh, boyfriend that was shot. Okay. <laughs> um, so you were a Houston Post reporter. Uh, was that at the time that you knew her, or was that after? No, that was, uh, that's how we met. Uh, actually, she was, uh, this, uh, the, the story actually is kind of a, a basic instinct type story, only instead of being a cop like Michael Douglas, I was a, a newspaper reporter. And um, I was the courthouse reporter there in the late 70s uh, for the Houston Post. And at the time, she was a, a lawyer working in the courthouse, but she was already under investigation for a murder that had occurred in January of 1979 of her uh, former lover, who she was claiming at the time had been a common-law husband. And... Um, she was under investigation for that, and uh, she was uh, trying to get his estate. He was a he was a Houston anesthesiologist who was from Argentina, and she had his name was George Tedesco, and she had gotten involved with him uh, a couple of years before and moved in with him, and uh, you know back in those days it was one of those like palimony kind of things which was kind of a new phenomenon uh, in love affairs. Um, and he was, he was beaten to death in January of 1979 in his garage. Uh, that, that murder case is still unsolved. Um, and at the time I met her about six months later, I was well aware of, of her uh, because my job as a courthouse reporter was to be aware of uh, criminal, pending criminal cases that might come into the courts, and uh, there had been some uh, newspaper articles about Catherine being the lead suspect in this murder uh, that, that they never could uh, pin on her. And um, 
at the time I was uh, estranged from my second wife and going through this uh, uh, estrangement. I was sleeping on a, a buddy's couch and uh, I was still going to the courthouse every day looking for cases. And um, I, uh, I happened to meet her uh, at, a, at a cocktail party thrown by a lawyer uh, where she was his date. And um, we struck up an acquaintance. I was uh, walked up to the bar. Uh, we were both getting a drink about the same time. And I just uh, looked at her and I said, so this is the notorious Catherine Mahaffey. And she sort of gave me this uh, sly grin and and uh, asked me who I was. When I told her I was a newspaper reporter, she went into a tirade about how she hated the Houston Post because they'd done this story on her and she had nothing to do with the murder of her, uh, of what she was calling him, her husband. Um, uh, but uh, that's how we that's how we first met. So she was kind of a, a, a side effect to my job, you might say. Hmm. But that didn't. So that that didn't kind of worry you to get involved with her um, with that kind of a history. And you know, I mean, does that does that put you on edge, sort of like? It, to actually date, date her, you know? Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not really uh, the kind of guy to run from a trouble like that. Um, she, she was actually, it actually sort of intrigued me, uh, the, the mystery of it. And uh, I, I thought I was fairly safe because, uh, number one, I, I really didn't have the kind of uh, money background that she seemed like the type that she would go after. And um, basically, we just, you know, we just talked for a while. We hit it off well. Uh, there were reasons I, I was I was interested in her, of course, mainly for the, the physical relationship. Uh, and I just have a lot of confidence in myself and I figure I can I can get out of problems I have all my life. Plus, as a newspaper reporter, I'd grown accustomed to being uh, acquaintances with all kinds of people, uh, politicians, prison inmates, uh, you know, every, everything. And uh, this was just another, another chance to kind of look at that seamier side of life. I, I really didn't uh, know, you know, what, what, would, what it would lead to. Um, and I thought I could probably disengage when the time came if I needed to do that. It actually gave me kind of an advantage in dealing with her because uh, in a lot of other of her relationships, and she's well known for having volatile relationships, um, other other men in her in her life sort of stumble across her and aren't sure what they're getting into. Uh, I was able to sort of back off and look at everything she said with a grain of salt and uh, Sort of take my uh, my chances and, and try to keep uh, try to try to keep some uh, balance about it and uh, it worked out to a certain extent although you know I did end up getting shot eventually <laughs> so I don't I don't guess it worked out perfectly but uh, uh, but luck was on my side and um, that's 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 basically what happened and our relationship lasted only. Oh, three or four months before uh, before it floundered on the rocks of violence. Um, but uh, what what was that three or four months like? Like, was it fairly normal as in a dating situation? And did you find that uh, what you guys did together, like went to a movie or went for dinner, uh, hung out, and all that, was everything kind of normal, or was it kind of a weird dating situation? Well, I described the first three weeks of it as a uh, sort of a civilized period. Uh, as far as being normal, you got to remember this is the 1970s. Uh, when I, when I, you know, when I sign my books, I sometimes write I blame it all on the 70s. But um, the, basically, like I said, I was living on the couch of a of a of a friend, one of my editors. So. Uh, and she was she was actually living renting a bedroom from a friend of hers who was a male, and uh, we basically just hung out at nights going to bars. She was basically a drinking buddy with benefits. Uh, that's uh, you know, and she was she was not I, like I've said before. Uh, uh, 
she, uh, she was a lot of fun when she wasn't trying to kill me. She was a, 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 you know, a well-educated lawyer. She was, uh, she, she was well-read. She was uh, very witty, uh, funny, a lot of fun to be around. Uh, we could go out drinking. And I was uh, in this state where I was uh, sort of uh, trying to get through my – I had just uh, separated from my second wife, had two, two children – and um, so I was kind of in a, a limbo-like uh, state anyway. And uh, w- that part of our relationship was uh, sort of uh, touch and go. I can remember, um, you know, there was, you know, qu- quite a bit of sex. Uh, she was, uh, she, she was, this was, like I said, the 70s, and there was no no holding back on, on anything. Um so we had that going for us, and it was a fairly exciting thing for me. Uh, I found out later, you know, she did have some reasons for for uh, being attracted to me that were uh, beyond any physical uh, physical relationship that we might have had. Um, you know, for for one thing, she viewed me uh, as my in my reporter capacity. She knew that. I, that I uh, spent my days at the courthouse and I was uh, uh, dealing with lots of people. And I, I think she she admitted this later that she saw me as kind of a buffer uh, for uh, the investigators that were trying to track her down on this murder case, which she continually told me she had nothing, nothing to do with it. Um, and she talked about it inc- incessantly. So it was uh, it was always interesting there. And um, she also later on, uh, uh, well, very early in the relationship, she tried to talk me into helping her get appointments as uh, uh, ind- for defending indigents uh, because she was having trouble getting appointed to cases and making money off of it. And she offered me a deal where she would uh, give me a, percentage of any money she got from the county for defending indigent cases where I had helped her secure the appointment. Um, you know, and I, I told her I couldn't do anything like that. I wasn't, you know, that was not in the books, but she kept uh, thinking that, uh, thinking that I would, uh, I would give into that. And then the more she got involved in my life, she realized that I, I did own a house, which was up for sale. So I had a little money. Of course, I was going to be split with my uh, with my ex-wife uh, whenever we got divorced. But um, she she continually saw angles that I thought for her would be uh, low low rent uh, too low rent for her. But um, as she told me later on, any uh, any amount of money is uh, everything she wants to get from me. So it it wouldn't matter. Uh, when, when the when I saw how uh, I, I, there there did come a point where I saw that she was really uh, more trouble than I could handle that I was basically playing with fire I, I I sought to end the relationship and from that period on out there was about a two month period of where there was uh, endless stalking and um, the kind of thing it, you got to remember this is late 1979. Uh, the term stalking really wasn't even in vogue. Uh, in fact, the first time I heard it was when I talked with uh, one of the prosecutors who'd been investigating her, and he told me that uh, we believe she stalked Tedesco uh, before he was murdered. And I thought about it, and I thought, you know, stalking—that's a pretty—that's uh, <laughs> that's a pretty good term for it because she would pop up everywhere. Um, she popped up at one of my divorce hearings and started yelling from the back of the room. Uh, she went to uh, uh, have a meeting with one of my uh, with my editor, my managing editor at the Post, and uh, made a lot of allegations about how I was secretly working for the police and trying to uh, uh, trying to uh, uncover her while I was pretending to be a reporter. Um, that led to a fairly funny episode where I was sitting in the courthouse press room um, and I got a call from a uh, friend of mine in the in the Houston Post newsroom 
and the way the newsroom was set up, there were all these glass walls where you could see into people's offices. And uh, I picked up the phone, and my my friend uh, Ed John said, um, "Hey Taylor, uh, your your psycho girlfriend is over here right now in the in uh, Kirk Logan's office. Uh, Logan happened to be our managing editor, and then he he uh, Ed uh, talked me through." Uh, uh, a, a visualization of everything that was going on, he would say, uh, and now she's pointing at him, and he's looking at her like uh, he he's he knows there are pornographic movies, but he's never been to one, and he's trying to figure out what it is, and uh, you know, then then he said, oh, she's leaving now, she's coming out the door. Wait, she's stopping, she's yelling at him again, and she's leaving, and then right after Ed hung up, I got a call from Kirk Logan, and he said. He wanted me to get over to the post right now. You know, back then I worked, I was strictly worked at the courthouse. I had an office there and I never went to the post except to get my check. And he told me, he said, I want you to drop what you're doing and just get in your car and come to the building. So I got to the building and he told me I was not going back to the courthouse, uh, that my days on that beat were over. And, uh, I said, I said, well, you know, I, I really like that beat. Um, uh, don't, you know, don't let her uh, take that, you know, don't believe anything she said. And he said, I don't believe anything she said, but I think you're in severe, serious danger, and I don't want you anywhere that she can come near you again. So, you know, that's how I ended my days on the courthouse beat. But um, eventually it ended up with uh, her um, staging a burglary of uh, – the place I was, I was at this point, I was renting a room from somebody else. I'd, I'd moved off my editor's couch and into a, a rental agreement with another friend. And a burglar showed up there one night and, uh, and uh, cleaned us out. And I uh, called her and accused her of doing it. And a couple of days later, after some negotiation, she, uh, agreed that she could return some of our stuff if I would come to her her um, uh, duplex where she was living. So I went over to her duplex and uh, I knew that uh, I knew that this was probably going to be the showdown. Uh, and uh, she explained to me some other things that she thought I might have other information on her because she was being investigated by the IRS. Uh, she was uh, being investigated by the State Bar of Texas. And she just didn't want me around because I had gotten too intricately involved in her uh, in her business. And uh, I had my buddy. He followed me over there and sat outside her her duplex in his car with a shotgun. He was supposed to be back up. He'd also called the district attorney's office to tell him I was over there. So, uh, you know, everybody had been telling me for weeks that I was probably a marked man. I know one of the investigators in town had made a bet with me at a Christmas party. He told me that uh, he bet me $100 that I wouldn't live to attend uh, the 1980 Christmas party. And I, I took the bet. <laughs> I took the bet. And uh, everywhere I went, people told me that uh, one of the other reporters told me that the next time he saw me, he expected I'd be wearing a toe tag. So, uh, Everybody was expecting this, and I basically, from my point of view, she had tormented me to a point where I just wanted to get something over with, and I thought I'll go over there, see what she does, give her a chance, and um, she managed to uh, to navigate me into a closet, um, telling me that some things were in there, and I, I realized... Uh, I didn't expect to see anything in the closet. We sat around drinking for a while, having uh, this really bizarre uh, evening where she read to me from The Godfather. Um, she uh, wanted to know, she wanted to speak philosophically about love and loss and things like that. And I just sort of played her game. And then uh, once I got in the closet, the lights went out and I heard a pistol cock and, uh, I realized I was trapped in a closet in her back bedroom, uh, and that uh, she was uh, coming, coming to uh, do whatever she was going to do, and that's where the confrontation occurred. 
So what if she just shot you in the back? Um, so was her intention to kill you, you think? Well, she, yeah, her intention was that she, she walked into the bedroom, and I was in the closet. As soon as I heard the gun cock, I realized that, uh, that I was in pretty serious jeopardy. And I looked around, and I thought, boy, what a fool. Here I am. I trapped myself in this closet. So she stepped into the bedroom, and I, could, I had the door between me and her, uh, and I could see out through the crack in the, uh, in the door jam. And she took the policeman's position there back against the wall on the other side of the room and uh, pointed the gun at me and said, that, uh, said I'm going to kill you now, and there's nothing you can do about it. So why don't you just come on out of the closet and take it? And so I started thinking uh, there's got to be something I can do here. And as luck would have it, um, there was a wooden chair sitting beside the closet. And I had actually, she had had me bring that wooden chair down from her attic a couple of months before. Uh, so I knew the chair was there and I could see it out the corner of the door. I started formulating a plan uh, and uh, decided I was going to uh, fight my way out of there using the chair for a shield. So um, she just continued to rage and rant and tell me how what a miserable, uh, miserable person I'd been. Um, and uh, well, finally, when she like took a breath and I saw her, I could see through the door jam that her eyes uh, sort of uh, went down. I kicked the door open and I picked up the chair and I came at her kind of like a lion tamer. And she fired off one shot. She was uh, using a 32. She fired off one shot and went through the chair, hit me in the side of the head, the left side of the head. They found the bullet later on the bed, um, you know, kind of kind of proof that my my head must be pretty hard. And I uh, I threw the I threw the chair at her, and then I went running down uh, running down the hallway to the front door, and I saw where she had deadbolted the front door it was one of those internal latches and i i remember making a uh, making a note in my head that uh, i would only get one chance to unlock that door so i stopped and unlocked the door got it open and that's when i got shot in the back and was blown through the door out into her front yard uh, and the bullet uh, later learned it stopped a centimeter from my heart. But um, when I got, got, I was laying on the, on the ground out there, and I could hear her coming out onto the porch. This was about 2 in the morning in, in a, a little area of downtown Houston, sort of a bohemian area that had a lot of, of uh, single-family homes. Lights were going on all over the neighborhood because the, the, the gunshots and uh, – I, uh, I wondered and I thought, uh, but boy, that bitch just shot me. <laughs> she really did shoot me. And uh, I uh, started to wiggle my toes and wiggle my fingers. And I thought, well, I'm not paralyzed. I better get up and run. So I jumped up and started running. Found out later that she pulled another gun out of a, out of a, uh, a dresser drawer and chased me down the street with that. And... Uh, I made it to an all-night uh, grocery store and was taken to the hospital. And uh, there at the hospital, uh, I got a call from, uh, well, when I got in the ambulance, I told the ambulance driver I'd been shot by a woman named Catherine Mahaffey because I didn't know if I was dying or what. And uh, they took me to the hospital. And by then, the uh, homicide detective, who I, who I, I had known, a guy named uh, John Donovan, was the homicide detective who was called to the scene of the shooting. And he was, he called me and I was in the hospital, uh, laying on the, on the gurney. And, uh, he actually started laughing. He said, Taylor, I got to tell you this, this scene over here looks like something out of a roadrunner cartoon. There's holes in the wall. And I, <laughs> I said, I was in like in no mood for laughter at that point. And I said, yeah, I, yeah, it must have been quite a show, huh? And he said, but tell me, which gun did you have? <laughs> I said, I didn't have a gun. And he said, well, she's over here telling me that one of these guns was yours and that she was uh, 
she shot you in self-defense. So uh, I said, well, I'm shot in the back, John. I mean, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're arresting her now. But I just wanted you to know I don't think it's over. And it wasn't. Uh, you know, we ended up with quite a quite a court case that went for two trials. And um, that's why in my book, you know, it's it's a sort of a conglomeration of a, everything from a psychological thriller to a to a courtroom procedural uh, and a uh, police procedural and a serial killer uh, uh, type of thing. There's all kinds of elements there, and uh, it was uh, it was quite a, quite an adventure. Well, uh, yeah, there's, it's, uh, it is kind of a strange name. Um, back then when I met her, uh, like I said, I was, I was sort of in one of those periods that anybody who's gone through a, a divorce, a lot of people have been through it. I was keeping my dirty laundry in a paper grocery sack and I used to call that bag luggage, my luggage by Kroger. And, uh, the first time we went out, uh, I, I, she called me, and we got together to go down to Galveston, uh, and uh, because I had a beach house down there, I was going to collect the rent uh, on the beach house, and I asked her if she wanted to drive along. So I drove over to her house to get her. We ended up going in her car, but um, I told her I wanted to get my luggage by Kroger out from the, my trunk in case somebody wanted to steal my dirty clothes. So... Uh, she thought that was quite a hoot that I was running around town with my clothes in a paper grocery sack. And uh, I've always thought that was kind of a metaphor for that period of my life. Uh, she and she was part of my luggage by Kroger. You know, she was she was something that popped out of that bag as well. And um, the the uh, you know, the title for that book, um, I, I hemmed and hawed about what to title it. One of my, one of my newspaper friends told me that title was unfortunate. I've had other reviewers say they thought it was really cool once they got into the story. And once I told my story about what life was like at that time and, uh, and all of that. But, um, the other title that I thought about was the widow wore red, uh, which was her favorite color. And when I met her, she was a widow wearing red, uh, which which uh, would have been uh, probably would have been more uh, commercial uh, title, but uh, I would, when I wrote this book, which I didn't write until 2009, uh, I was less interested in the commercial aspects than I was in the process of uh, actually just uh, recording this story for posterity and for my descendants to have an accurate accounting of what happened to me back in. Uh, 1979 and 1980. Uh, in the meantime, since then, she had gone on to other other investigations and had become such a uh, uh, s such a, a figure that uh, I had actually gotten a movie deal in 2004 for rights to my story. This was previous to writing the book, and I'd gotten money for that. Um, it, it actually was produced and it starred Melanie Griffith as her, as a character based on her, and it starred Isai Morales as a character based on me. Uh, it didn't get a lot of wide play. The title of the movie was Heartless, but I, I did get my $65,000 for rights to that story. And uh, after that came out, I had some people say, you know, you ought to write this down. And I... Um, I decided that uh, that I could do it, but I I wanted I didn't want it to make it some sort of a whiny memoir. I tried to channel uh, like a Mickey Spillane type of character, telling it in the first person and keeping a bit of humor about it because, in some ways, it is a humorous story. Although to some of the people affected by her later on, after after she came off probation, in my case, uh, it's not too humorous, but, um, you know, if I'd have been paralyzed, it probably wouldn't be very funny either, but uh, there's quite a bit of, uh, I try to get quite a bit of humor in the book as well, and not, you know, not be one of these pitiful victims, uh, which 
which I, I've never uh, like fancied myself as a classic victim. I uh, I realized that I, I I I bought into this going into it. I knew what I was getting into basically, and knew I was playing with fire, and uh, I got burned, and uh, I realized that also a hell of a story. So uh, I was interested in telling that as well. Have you have you talked with her since the book came out, or even the movie? And and if you had any interactions, and uh, what's any feedback from her? <laughs> no interactions with her since August of 1980, which was about six months after after the shooting and three months after her conviction in my case, uh, where where she sought me out in a bar and and uh, asked me to. Uh, uh, she was going to said she was going to appeal the case, and she wanted me to drop the charges, et cetera. Now, when I when uh, I appeared on Oprah Winfrey in 1987, after Fatal Attraction came out as a movie, and uh, I and I was uh, at the time I was freelancing, and I was uh, the backup for the Time Magazine correspondent in Houston. And so the People magazine was doing a story on true life fatal attractions. They knew my background, my story, so I became one of the people profiled in that story. Right after that, I started getting all these requests to go on TV. And uh, this was in the late 80s, and Oprah Winfrey was one of them. They tell me that they contacted her at the time. Uh, she was still on probation in my case. And so she did not go on the show. I was on the show by myself. And uh, I was never on a show with her. 48 Hours got her on a show on, on a show about her later in 2003. And uh, I was on that show, and we weren't together on it. But it's kind of funny because when the book came out, I noticed uh, <laughs> I noticed that one of the Amazon reviews, I read it, and I thought uh, it, the, the review was simple, and it was an anonymous review, and it said simply, this book is so bad, I hope Catherine gets another shot at him. And uh, I uh, <laughs> immediately, when I read that, I knew uh, she's read the book <laughs> because I, I'm convinced that was her review. <laughs> well, there you go. Now you know. But nothing um, else, nothing else, no she lives. She's lived back in Houston now, and uh, still lives in Houston. And um, I've never had any con any contact with her at all. Wow. What? So, what are you hoping that people get out of your book? Like when they when they pick up the book and read it, what is it that you want them to take away with it? Well, I think for one thing, uh, there's uh, there it's a, it's an intricate intricate study of. Uh, of a, a stalking uh, case, uh, usually a lot of these, a lot of the times, you've got most true crime books. The victim is dead, so uh, they're unable to tell their story. In my case, I was almost dead. So uh, basically, you've got a story that's told by the victim, uh, and uh, it it it's got the mindset, the mental. Uh, calculations. Uh, if there's any any moral to it, um, I think uh, there's a lot of lot of lessons to be learned just from watching, uh, observing what happens in a relationship like this, and how it can be played out. Uh, back then, uh, sexual relationships were uh, uh, entered into quite haphazardly, and uh, Maybe that's a maybe that was a problem. Um, uh, there's also a subplot of my uh, my my uh, divorce case uh, got uh, fairly uh, ended in kind of s sort of violence as well. Uh, and the the whole book is kind of like a. Um, uh, well, the way I've built it before is Fatal Attraction meets Angela's Ashes to one extent, and then Kramer versus Kramer meets Fatal Attraction to another extent. Uh, my my second wife uh, got involved, played quite a role in it because Catherine uh, was uh, 
did said at one point on uh, having her dealt with, uh, uh, you know, claiming that she could bring her thugs in to beat her up. And uh, so she was involved uh, to a certain extent. And then later on, I ended up with custody of my daughters before this was all over with uh, when my ex-wife uh, attempted suicide. And uh, I had to, I was she called me and I came over and uh, to where she was and she'd taken some pills and I got her uh, uh, got her in an ambulance and uh, she was taken away. And uh, my two daughters at the time were five and uh, uh, I want to say five and three at the time. And uh, so I ended up with them. That's how I, I quit working at the Houston Post at that point and became a freelance writer and did that for 17 years. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, uh, this was this happened after Catherine's conviction, but it's uh, like the last chapter in my book because uh, all this happened over the course of a year from September of 1979 until September of 1980. I had all these things going on. So... Um, and, you know, there's entertainment value, too, I think. Um, I didn't want to I didn't want to write a a um, a uh, basic slash and burn true crime. I mean, I I I enjoy the true crime genre and I've, I've been a fan of it. I've read lots of true crime and uh, I have, you know, some favorite books on, of, of true crime that I like. But uh this was a combination uh, memoir, and it's a, a true crime story. So hopefully uh, readers will take, uh, might take different things out of, uh, out of what, uh, they, what they get from, from my story. So do, do you have a, a website or anything set up for people to come visit you or see anything you, you're doing or done, uh, or do you stay away from social media? Like no, no, that? I'm I'm fully. <laughs> I I don't I really don't fear any anything. I I have a public page on Facebook. I have a website. I also have a blog uh, called. Uh, uh, I've been laughing all the way to the river. Uh, part of my blog is I've been retired since 2012, so I'm not um, I'm not really engaged in writing a lot anymore, uh, except when I feel the urge, and that's what my my blog is. Uh, my blog I've I've tried uh, transferring a lot of my uh, magazine articles from when I was a freelancer in the 80s and 90s and uh, uh, lodged them there. So it's a blog spot on, um, on uh, uh, you know, Google Blogs. And I have uh, other, other things that I blog about occasionally, but not too, not too often. I've, in retirement, I've done a lot of genealogical research, and I've, I've uh, written some of that up. I spend a lot of time with that. Um, I've, uh, you know, I went for years thinking I was... Uh, poor white trash, and then I kicked over a genealogical rock and discovered I'm a, a Mayflower descendant. So, you know, I've, I've reassured all my friends that uh, I'm not going to let that go to my head. Uh, but there's that. The uh, the Amazon page, I try to make that uh, a really uh, solid, um, a really solid uh, backgrounder on the book. There's a lot of things there. Uh, a Q&A. Uh, I have a Q&A on my blog about uh, w that I did uh, with uh, with another uh, true crime uh, interviewer a, a few years ago that goes through all of my my thought process on doing the book. And I've also got that posted at the Amazon uh, uh, pr profile page for the book. Uh, I have another book as well that I did after that I did in 2010. It's a another kind of true crime book about uh, the closing of the notorious Chicken Ranch uh, prostitution house in Texas that uh, was made into the movie The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, and uh, that was a story all to itself about my uh, getting hired to actually write the definitive version of that story uh, 
back when back when the movie was going to come out with Dolly Parton and Burt Reynolds. Uh, the publisher went broke before they could publish the book, but so I I hauled it out a couple of years ago and self published it, and that's on Amazon as well. So I've got a profile page there, and uh, the profile pages for the book are are are, are pretty. Uh, are pretty well uh, documented. Fantastic. Now we're going to have that up on our website. We'll put your book up there as well so people can do one click when they're listening. Um, so again, uh, the book is called Luggage by Kroger. It's a true crime memoir, and it's by author Gary Taylor. Thank you for being hey, here. Thanks a lot for having me. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This is a production of Something Weird Media.